May we sing your song in our hearts, with our lips, and with our lives in this hour and always. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I always enjoy uh, whatever happens here in every aspect of our worship. And uh, music is such an easy thing to take delight in. But uh, thanks to 504 and friends, Questlove and the Roots crew ain't got nothing on IWS. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I want to begin <clears throat> with uh, this morning with an apology, and it's actually something more than an apology. It actually is a repentance. Uh, <clears throat> when I began Thursday morning uh, talking about um, nature, cosmology, uh, all that all creation that God has made, and I applauded the cosmology of the Hindus because it's so much more vivid and dynamic and robust than what we have grown up with. And then I quickly went on to say something very disparaging and derogatory about Hindu theology, just simply because it's polytheistic. And uh, one of our uh, beloved uh, member, fellow colleagues here uh, approached me very lovingly on that last night and brought it to my attention and said, you know, that second part didn't help. And I knew immediately that they were right. I didn't need to trash Hinduism. Uh, I tell you what made it the, even worse is the reason that I did it. Because I was applauding something in a polytheistic religion, I wanted to rush to assure you that I was still okay. <laughs> that, that to identify with orthodoxy, but it's never right to trash the dignity of anyone. Whether they're a heretic, they disagree with you, they, you're, you're violently opposed to what they think. So I repent for that and, uh, and I urge us to always have that spirit among us where iron can sharpen iron. We can lovingly correct one another. I, I was very thankful for that correction and hope to grow from it. Um, zeitgeist, the powers, and elemental spirits. And you know, I, each, actually each of those three are worthy of a morning, or worthy of a course <laughs> to be studied. Uh, talking about zeitgeist to start with, I first heard the word zeitgeist, I think I was about 10th or 11th grade. And I read it in a book and I, I've always been a lover of words, and I could tell, well, it looks like a German word, and Geist, I'm guessing that's ghost, began to learn that it was the spirit of the age or the spirit of the time. It's not just an album by the Smashing Pumpkins. It's not just a Hegelian philosophical term, and I don't know why it's associated with Hegel. I don't, I've not read a lot of philosophy, but uh, I don't think that Hegel actually ever used the term, but for some reason it gets associated with with Hegel. But if you think about zeitgeist, and, 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 and people just assume that this is all coincidental, that, uh, that it's kind of like the ocean that just kind of shifts and, and moves around. But if you think about it, Darwinism and some theories from another man named Alfred Wallace emerged at the same time. They ba basically wrote the same things at the same time, the same ideas at the same time. If you think about the season, it began really earlier, probably in the 15th century, but came to full flower in the 17th, 18th century of the witch hunts that happened in Europe, happened in the US, happened around the world, really. They were scattered in cultures around the world. I wonder, is that coincidental that that spread and happened around the world at that time? I've noticed, too, that um, in my work in the arts, if, if you're working on a song or a, a work of art on a particular topic, odds are someone else across town or in another city or in another country is writing a song about a similar topic, maybe with a similar hook. Why is it that 
The Illusionist and The Prestige, two movies about magicians, happened at the same time, virtually on top of each other. This two movies uh, about this subject or that, this person or that, happen at the same time. And there are probably more that we haven't even heard about. I believe it's because of these, these spirits, many whom are fallen, that are at play in our world, in the cosmos. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. What, what are the powers? I first began to think about the powers in 73 or 74. I was an employee at Word Records in Waco, and they had a little book publishing company, and they published a book by William Stringfellow called An Ethic for Christians and Other Aliens in a Strange Land. I'd never heard of William Stringfellow. I began reading it, and he, he basically was saying that the powers are the corporations, and they're the nations. They're all the entities around us that shape and move what's going on. And these things are not just collective entities of people, groups of people with a purpose. They actually get inhabited by the powers, the fallen powers. And even good countries do bad things. And even good corporations do bad things. People behave badly even in a just war. He would have said that the powers are the isms and the ologies, if you will, the man, ubiquitous, it's everywhere. I remember in the 70s, uh, really love, well, 60s actually, in 70s, loving Jesse Penn Lewis' War on the Saints, and later, a book I used to talk with Bob Weber about a lot, God at War by Gregory Boyd, looking into the powers, the, 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 those cosmic powers that are at work, many demonic forces. I didn't know at the time that I read Stringfellow that a lot of his ideas had come from a man named Hendrik Burkhoff, Christ and the Powers, published in 1962. And it deeply impacted Stringfellow and Elul and many writers since then. And I became more convinced of this over the last few years as the Supreme Court has, I don't know how many decisions have come down from our Supreme Court, probably 10 or 12 or more, where they are talking about the personhood of corporations, corporate personhood. These decisions decide to treat corporations as de facto beings, human beings. They're not human beings, they're aggregations of human beings, but they are powers and they're being treated as beings, as spiritual entities. The scriptures uh, this morning from Galatians and from uh, Colossians talk about the elemental spirits. Now typically what we have done as we have considered the elemental spirits is we've thought theologically as these are the, uh, el the rudimentary principles of the world, of the cosmos, of civilization. Perhaps thinking our most, spiritual, our most spiritual thoughts, are they the spirits behind the principles, the law, all of those things? But I noticed that Justin Martyr in two or three places refers to the sun, moon, and stars as heavenly elements using this same language. And I wonder if here, like the Hindus get it so right about how vivid and robust the elements of nature, the cosmos is. I wonder if my Native American friends, I have several Native American friends who are deeply committed Christians, but they know the reality of the spirits in nature, of rocks and hills and panthers and leopards and rivers and streams and oceans. And anyone that you've ever known that comes from a culture where the old folk religions still are in play, know that that's all very real stuff. Earth, wind, fire, air. And those things are being brought back under the reign of God through the cross of Christ, along with the zeitgeist, along with all the powers, it will all be brought under the throne of Christ to his glory and for the peace 
of humankind and all creation. Please stand for the prayers.